God bless you, you may be seated. We're gonna jump into the word today. I will be teaching from the book of 1 Samuel and uh, 1 Samuel um, and I, I have been redundant in my teaching because that's, that's good teaching when you're redundant. It lets you pick up where you left off. And last week I, I, I talked about, um, I, I started talking about the contrast between Samuel and his generation. So if you would read 1 Samuel chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, what you're going to find is the whole narrative, the whole narrative of the story is that there needed to be a baby that was born, a baby that was born, and uh, that would not be uh, uh, raised like the other children of that generation. There needed to be a child that would be preserved. And I talked about it went so far in the, initial, in the first teaching, I was telling you that when I was praying years ago, I was in Memphis, Tennessee, and I said, God, who am I going to be preaching to tonight? The Lord... The Lord spoke to me. He said, you're going to be preaching to a Samuel. Everybody say Samuel. The Lord said, you're going to be preaching to a Samuel generation. I said, I don't know what you mean. He said, I caused Hannah's womb to be barren because I didn't just need another baby. I needed somebody that would make a vow to me to train that baby different than the other children of that day. And uh, I had to go look it up. And sure enough, the Bible says the Lord caused Hannah's womb to be barren and she made a vow, and she made a vow and said, Lord, if you'll give me a, a baby. Um, and her vow was, uh, the Bible says she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, in chapter 1, verse 11, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head, meaning that he would take on the vow of a Nazarite. What's the difference between a Nazarene and a Nazarite? A Nazarene was raised in Nazareth. A Nazarite in number six would take a vow, would not put a razor on his head, would not cut his hair, um, would not take of the vine, and would not be around dead things, and uh, wouldn't even go to funerals. And she was saying, he's going to be different. If you will give him to me, I'll make sure that he's different. From the very moment that uh, she went to the house of God and prayed and to what? The preacher thought she was what? Anybody know? Preacher thought she was drunk. Marked her mouth. One translation believed that he smacked her. How dare you? How dare you come to the house of God drunk? She said, I'm not drunk. She had lost her voice. I personally believe that she had prayed so long she lost her voice. That's desperation. The Bible says her mouth moved, but you couldn't hear what she was saying. And I'm um, just being, going back, just a quick review here. Uh, cliff Notes. And, um, uh, and, and marked her mouth and she said, I'm not drunk, I'm desperate. And when she, he realized this woman was passionate about having a child, uh, he prophesied to her and he said, God's going to give you the baby. And sure, sure enough, the next year she had a baby. And a man child, the Bible's using the King James Version, but she had a boy. It's a boy. And uh, when the baby was born, it's a boy. Everybody say it's a boy. And uh, when, when the boy was born, she weaned him and she told her husband because every year they would make a, uh, go to the, Drew, they, would, they would go to Shiloh and make a sacrifice at the house of God, the tabernacle. And uh, when they get there, they make a sacrifice and they would take their tithes, their offerings. If, they were, if, you, were a, if you were a crop farmer, you would take 10% of it and you would sell that and whatever you had in your 10%, you would, you would go to the house of God and every year they would return to the pilgrimage and they'd pay their tithes. And when they did, they would, they would throw a party right at the gate of the temple, right at the gate of the house of God. And they say, look what God has done. And they would give their tithes and they would hand a blessing to their family. God has been given good to us. And they would actually celebrate the blessing of the Lord in their life. So they would do that every year and they would give a sacrifice, uh, a sacrifice unto the Lord. And when they would do that, it was a time of cheering. That's why the Bible says, blessed is the cheerful giver. You, you don't give begrudgingly saying, oh, boy, you don't look at your kids and say, oh, we'd have been on vacation, but we're blessing a missionary. You know, you know, that's not what it's like. No, we're able to go because we're blessed. And, uh, and we give and we bless. And so the, that was what would happen every year. And they would give this sacrifice and say, God has been good to me. Can I stop here and say, every single Sunday, you need to be able to look over your week and say, look what the Lord has done. 
Look what God has done in our lives. We're healthy, we're together. Amen. And I, I title this, that's why the praise singers at 11 o'clock we're going to praise and worship. I've been to churches, you know, they, you, you know a cry face isn't very beautiful. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Get your best cry face on. I mean, it looks like you're straining. We shouldn't be worshiping the Lord and look like we're in pain. But when you're worshiping, the Bible says, uh, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And when you are worshiping God, there ought to be this joy. Amen. That's right. And I realize nervousness sometimes. And there's times that we're singing about altars and we're crying. We're singing about sacrifice and we're crying. There's days up here I'll look, my own daughter's tears are dripping off of her chin as she's worshiping the Lord because of the heartfelt. We've seen that. We, uh, there's times I worry. You see these worshipers, that the way they lead us in worship. But amen. There is happiness in in worship. There's happiness in praising him. Can you shout hallelujah? And so she tells her husband, she said, when, I, when Samuel is weaned, she said, then once he's weaned, then we are going to, uh, I'm going to take him and give him back to the Lord, but until he's weaned. And so for years, she didn't go. I, I gave you my opinion. I believed it was probably around 12, uh, that maybe six, but I think probably closer to 12, we can certainly prove that he was still growing. Um, I don't think he was three, as I said last week and the week before, but around 12. So she takes him to the house of God and she, she drops him off of the house of God. They, they give the sacrifice. They did the worship. They went through the routine. And the Bible says when she saw him last week, when she saw him worship, the last verse of chapter one, and he worshiped the Lord there. It's the same verse or the same word for worship that she did when the Samuel, when Eli, the priest, prophesied she's going to have a baby. Oh, bow. Oh, just like that. Would you just bow? Just lean forward, bow. That's what the word worship in that context means. There's several different Hebrew words for praise. And uh, one means to get on your knees. Another one means to extend the hand. And uh, one, one means to sing. And one means to shout. You know, there's all these emotional exuberances of praise to God. But this word for worship meant she bowed before him. When she looked and saw Samuel, when she put him in the house of God and said, I'm leaving you here to worship the Lord. I'll be back next year. That wouldn't be easy for a mother. But when she saw him love the Lord and worship God like this, when she saw him worship, it did something to her. As a matter of fact, the next chapter, the next statement says, and Hannah prayed, chapter two, verse one, and I'm teaching you today, and I can't help but get excited when I think of the goodness of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We, we're, we, when I think of my children worshiping him, Paul said there's no greater joy. There's no greater joy than to know that your children walk in truth. And at the anchor, we are committed to your children from the time they're born, from the cradle to the grave. Amen. It doesn't matter if you're brand new here. It doesn't matter if you're a newborn here or if you're 103 here. There is a growth and we believe that everybody has a divine purpose. Amen. The children in the nursery, they would take them from the moment they were born in Deuteronomy 6. And he said, when thou rise us up and lie us down, when you come in and you go out, let the word of the Lord, they would say, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And they would teach them from the moment they were children. Even Paul told Timothy, he said, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. That's why we have children's ministry and then youth ministry, and young adults ministry, and young marriage ministry, young families ministry. We have that, why? Because no matter where you are in life, you ought to be committed to growing in the Lord, amen. How many wanna grow in the Lord today? I want to grow in grace and the, I just feel like saying this, I just believe God can do anything. There's nothing too big, there's nothing too small, amen. So, so when she saw in worship, chapter two, verse one, and I think that I, we ought to aspire to that. We ought to want to see our children in church. Children worshiping, children praying at home, children reading their Bible. And it says when she, and he worshiped the Lord there. So she saw that. Verse, chapter two, verse one, and Hannah, what? Prayed and said, my heart rejoiceth. That meant, she, that, that word rejoice is the same one that, you, you'll see in the New Testament, the Bible says that Jesus rejoiced when 
He, he said, don't rejoice because the devils are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your name's written in heaven. That meant that he jumped up and down and spun in circles. He was so excited about your name being written. That's what she was saying. My heart rejoices. I feel so excited. There ought to be excitement in the church. I've been in churches where I fall asleep. Then I went again and fell asleep the next time. I didn't go a third time. There ought to be something. I, I've been in churches where I felt like they, were, they wanted me to go to hell. I had been there. I've been in churches where it was sad and down and out. And, but there ought to be in the church, there ought to be, the Bible says you're the salt and you're the light. We ought to have a church, and we do, where children want to be here and say, oh, it's the happiest place in town. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Come on, this is better than anything out in the world. How many know it's better than alcohol and better than drugs and better than some worldly party? There's nothing like being in the house. It's better than a ray. It's better than anything you'll find. Jesus. I want everybody to say this with me. It's in Isaiah 12, and, and I believe it's verse 3. The Bible says, with joy, with joy. shall you draw waters out of the wells of salvation. That word salvation is the word in the New Testament that is Jesus. With joy shall you draw water out of the wells of Jesus. I've never seen anybody get a drink out of the wells of salvation. They didn't have a smile on their face and say, oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, it's so good to live for the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. And uh, I've, I've told the story before. I used to hear my dad tell it. And said, uh, uh, said, said, the boy's grandmother was, you know, saved, you know, and said that the, the cats, the cats were chasing each other and said, y'all need to straighten up. You got to be serious. Said, looked over and said, the boy's grandmother looked at the dog that was spinning, chasing his tail and said, you need to quit that. You got to be serious. Everything was serious. He couldn't play, he couldn't smile, he couldn't laugh because living for God was about being serious. Said, he walked in the old barn and said, look, there was an old mule standing there down and out. He said, well, praise God, you got grandma's religion. Shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be be that way. It ought to be a joy. When you get up in the morning, your feet hit the floor. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. Happiest people in the world should be the people that are saved, amen, by Him. Somebody shout, rejoice. When should you rejoice? Evermore. Another verse says, rejoice evermore. So when she saw that, the, that what is known as chapter two, verse one. I'm moving on because I, I did a lot with this last week. But chapter two, verse one says, and Hannah prayed. This is actually written as Hannah's. It's, it's known in theology as Hannah's song. She started singing when she saw her son rejoicing. When she left, the last thing that Samuel saw when his mother looked at him and said, I have weaned you and trained you to give you back to the Lord because you're special. She didn't, he didn't see her weeping and crying. I can't believe I gotta leave my, my baby. No, she made a vow that she would do that. When he saw her rejoicing, it did something in him. It really did. She believed that he was special and he believed that he was special. And when that happened, there was a faith in what mom's vow was and there was faith in what mom said I'm gonna be. You, as a parent, need to speak faith into your children. You should never say, well, shame on you. The worst part of the cross was not the nails or the thorns. It was shame. The Bible says he bore our shame. He bore our grief. You should never look at your children and say, shame on you. Why? Because shame is the hardest part of life. We hide from God because of shame. We'll hide from friends because of shame. People won't go to church because of shame. I mean, no, it's true. We put shame on them. We should say, you know what? You know better than that. We act better than that in this family. You should not be acting that way instead of shame on you. And uh, if you, you keep doing that, you're going to be in prison the rest of your life. Don't, don't say that. You say this. Don't do that. We don't act that way. God's got something better for you, and you need to act the way God wants you to act. And uh, my dad used to say to me, boy, was you born in a barn? 
One time it came to the tip of my tongue, but I didn't say it. I, was, I almost said, well, Jesus was, but I, I didn't say it. I did not say it. I was smarter than that. And, uh, but, but he was saying, shut the door when you go out. Turn the lights off. And, and uh, thank God for a parent that's involved and will train and say, no, that you shouldn't eat that much. Spouses are looking at each other. Like, your mama didn't teach you, did she? Yeah. <laughs> but there's limitations. And I did, a, did a study. I did a study. An unclean animal in the Bible was an animal that had no limitations. It, it would eat anything. And uh, a, a human being that has no limitations is animal-like. And when you, when you become animal-like, you're no longer in the form of God. It's called ungodly. You were made in the image of God, which means there's lim- even the Garden of Eden had uh, limitations. He said, don't eat of that tree. Everything else you can have, but don't touch that one. In every person that's blessed life, there's going to be limitations. There's things you don't watch. There's words you don't use. There's clothes you don't wear. There's places you don't go. It's called holiness. How many, how, there's thoughts you, don't, you shouldn't have or th- dwell on. How many of those are true? And when you're training up children, you train them up with limitations. And you say, you've had enough to eat. Uh, that's enough candy. And you need to turn the game off. You need to turn the phone off. Uh, it's time for bed. You're not staying up all night. It's time to get up. You can't sleep all day. And what you learn is what you're saying to that person with limit. Listen, your children probably won't come to you and say, would you please give me rules? But they'll come to me and say that. When I was youth pastor, this is what young people say. Say, I wish my parents would give me a curfew. I wish they would tell me no. I had parents, kids that tell me that. They'd have never went to mom and dad because they, they realized they would have lost some of their, their freedoms and rights. But to me as their pastor, they would say, it would let me know that they at least care. Children want limitations. They're concrete thinkers. They, 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 they want you to be direct with them. They... they They don't want to be your friend. They want to be your kid. And one of the problems in parenting is we make our children our friends before they're adults. If you'll be the parent while they're youth, young, and teenagers, they'll have a life's friend. But you can't be their friend when they're 15. You don't vent to your kids. You vent to your friends. And when she was weaning him, there was limitations in the relationship. And everybody say limitations. And so I'm just giving you teaching and uh, uh, because I, my, my life is dealing with people and, and I've been in jails and juvenile jails and I deal with people. I have for many years. I've been preaching since I was 11. Next week I turned 44. And my life has been dealing with people. But you got to realize parenting is, it has to be a, a place of wisdom and, and, and limitations. And she, she, here, let me get back on board, on, back on, on this. He sees her rejoicing. He sees her rejoicing. Your children need to see a rejoicing in you and not venting all your problems to them. That's right. There are conversations my wife and I will have that our children will never hear. And I can vent to her. She's my best friend. She can vent to me because I'm her best friend. But there's things and there's times in life I teach them these are the problems of life and this is how you get through life. But they need to see rejoice and happy. If they see me sad all the time, you think they're going to want to live my life? If they think I'm miserable, are they going to want to live my life? No, they're going to be looking for a better one. How I many know it's true? If I had a friend that was sad for the last 20 years, I'd probably have a new friend at some point. Some point it's got to get better. Can you say amen? And so he sees, everybody say, the last thing he saw was his mother rejoicing. And singing. So the, the song ends in 1 Samuel chapter 2 um, and verse 10. And verse 11 it says, And, El- and El- Elkanah, which was Hannah's husband, Samuel's father, uh, Elkanah went to Ramah to his house. That was their home. That's where Samuel was born, was in Ramah. And the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Watch what it says. It says, Watch what happens. So when they went home, Samuel did what he was taught to do. He ministered, everybody say, unto the Lord. Everybody say, minister unto the Lord. True weaning a child in the church is not teaching them to go to church. It's to minister to the Lord in the church. Uh, I probably 
uh, didn't ever have to ask whether we were going to church on Sunday. It was just a given that we're going to do that. I asked Sawyer one time. I said, Sawyer, I said, uh, I was doing a study. I was getting ready to preach a meeting about why. I was getting ready to preach a conference, a children's service. And I was going to talk about why kids walk away from the Lord. And I said, Sawyer, I said, uh, what do you think uh, I should do as the pastor to keep children in the church the rest of their life? And uh, because a lot of people leave and then they come back broken and scarred and mistakes, they call it backslidden and regrets. I've had so many, I've never had a backslider come back and say, I'm so glad I backslid. Not one. They come back and said, I wish I'd have stuck it out and stayed and prayed more and fasted and forgiven and, and, and things like that. But I said, sir, what do you think would take? He said, I would say, he was 10. He said, I would say if you'd involved me, you'd probably keep me in church. And I think it's true. And I think Hannah was making a vow. I'm not going to wait till he's an adult to get him involved. I make a vow that I'm going to get him involved when he's young. I'm going to train him as a time as he's a child. But when he's a youth, I'm going to have him minister unto the Lord. You've got to teach your children. We're not going to church because if we don't, pastor's going to call us. Or that's just a checkbox on the list because we're just, we're just trying not to go to hell. And you know, that's sometimes the mindset of people. I go to church because I don't want to be lost. That can't be the motive. It might be an original motive that says, I don't want to be lost. I feel convicted. I want to turn away from my sin. Yes, that's in the progression of faith, but it can't stay there. We're not going to church just to not go to hell. We're going to church to go to heaven. We're going to church to be a blessing. We want to worship the Lord. There is a, a different motive than just being lost. Amen. To serve the Lord. I'm going to tell you right now, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Oh, I love that old cross for the dearest and best, for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Something's got to get in the kid that said he saved me. And now I'm so thankful. I just want to bless him. Thank you for the goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Somebody shout amen. And so they a desire to serve. And that's why you'll see young people on cameras and you'll see children in our 11 o'clock service that'll be singing with our adults up here because we believe involving our children in the church. This is not an old person's church. This is not an adult church. This is a church for every soul because souls do not come in sizes. A soul is a soul is a soul. Oh, let me just talk to you for a minute. We should be kingdom minded. And the Bible says soul winners. In Jesus' comparison to the value of a soul was this. He said, what shall a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What's he talking about? You can get all the wealth and all the riches and all the yachts and vacation homes and, and vacations and, and, and all of the, the cars and whatever you want. The nicest clothes. I mean, ladies, you can be wearing red bottom shoes. I hear they're not comfortable, but you wear them. You can have all the nicest clothes. You can have all the nicest stuff, the best stocks. You can have all, but he said, what shall a man profit to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? This is what Jesus was saying. The value of one person, one soul is more valuable than all the gold and the copper and the silver and all the mines in the whole world. To God, you are valuable at birth, even in the womb, you are valuable when you're old and to the great. You're valuable to him. Can you say, I am valuable to God? God's not against you. He's for you. And that's why we give to missions because we want to reach souls. That's why we got seven other campuses in this area because we want to reach souls. We want to love what God loves. Can you say amen? And so every one of you in this building are fearfully and wonderfully made. You've been made in the image of God, not the image of an animal, but you've been made in the image of God. He values every single one of us. Amen. That's why Jesus, that's why Jesus, when he, you, you'll even see him sitting there and he lets the little children come around him because children are important to God. It cannot be in our homes, be seen and not heard. Sit down and shut up. Oh no, they graduate from your home. They don't know how to cook. They don't know how to clean. They don't know how to be disciplined because they were just in the room, but never trained. 
God gave you them not to feed and to give a, a roof over their head and a place to sleep. He gave them to you to train them up to be men and women of the Lord that are righteous and holy and their desires are the things to do good, to be well, to be disciplined. Come on. I still think it's okay that our children look at an elder and say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, sir. No, ma'am. Should be this elder talking to the kid uh, and, and they don't even talk to him. They just tuck their head and walk away. I don't let my kids be shy. I don't let them. Well, my kids bashful, so are mine. But I, if, if you're talking to them, you're an adult and you address my children and you come up and talk to them even when they're this tall, I, I, I'm not gonna accept that. They're gonna be respectful to adults. If an adult comes and says, uh, Finn, and he's, he's a little bit timid, he's not at the house, I'll tell you that much. He's very, very, very persistent, very confident. If he says, hey dad, one time, he says, hey dad, a thousand. What my dad told me was, hey dad's in the Bible, it is. H-A-D-A-D, -A -D. hey dad, it's in there. Hey dad, 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 I'll say, not right now. It's not 30, it's not 20 seconds. Dad, can you, can you? He's in the turtles right now. Want me to catch turtles? Every day, hey dad, he's persistent. With you, he's shy. You come up to him and you say something to him, he is, he is shy. But I don't let him do that. I, I, will, I will say, lift your chin, look him in the eye, and say, yes sir, yes ma'am, and answer the question. Because you, you've got to put confidence in your kids. I don't want him to think he's less of anybody because he's a little... Amen. And one thing so powerful about this church, you love people no matter who they are. How many know God loves every single one of us in this room? Watch this. Samuel, Samuel ministered. Samuel ministered under the Lord. Everybody saying the child ministered. Look at verse 12 though. The contrast between Samuel and his generation. Look at verse 12. It says Samuel ministered. Now watch what it says. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. You, you could say, when you're studying Belial, here's what I get out of studying Belial. I mean, son of the devil. Uh, they're, acting, they're acting like the devil. No limitations. When you study Belial, what you're going to find out is in the study of Belial is they have no limits on their emotions. No limits. Everybody say no limits. Whatever they want, they do. Whatever they want. Anger. When they get mad, they say whatever. Do whatever, they go to an extreme case. The Bible says that a, a person doesn't control their spirit is like a city without walls. Everybody take your hands. Help me teach real quick. This is Bible class. Take your hand. You have these walls up. Walls, walls aren't to keep you in. They're to keep stuff out. I, I mean, no, your door can open from the inside, but it's locked so they can't get in on the outside. If it's locked both directions, that's a prison. It's locked on one side. It's to keep stuff out. Aren't you glad you have a roof over your head to keep stuff out? How about in the winter time? You can keep cold out. You can put the heat in. Come on, don't, don't put your walls down. You'll get in trouble if you don't have any walls down. Some of you are about to get wet right now. Amen. Keep your walls up. The Bible says a, a, a person that does not control their spirit or their emotions are like a city without walls. What you do is you open your life to anything. Spirits. There's, the Bible talks about spirit, a lot about spirits. And when you just, you get so angry, you just explode. Bah! You open yourself up. Some of the most chaotic stuff I've ever dealt with was when I found a parent, uh, a parent that, that one of the worst cases I've ever done with is when I went to a parent one time and it was many, many years ago and that parent just lost it over something very calm. Uh, it could have been handled very, but they could not control their spirit. And when they did, they did like this. And some of the most immoral stuff I'd ever dealt with many years ago, was in that family. That, they opened their whole home up to stuff. She opened her all children up to stuff. Stuff that allowed in that house because she had no limitations. I'm just going to tell you right now, the Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. So for all of you to get angry, there's Bible to give you permission to be angry. Be ye angry. We don't teach our children to not be emotional. It's okay to get upset. Don't let your kids say, you shouldn't be getting mad right now. I've done that many times. You shouldn't be mad right now. I need to say, it's okay to be mad, but you're still wrong. Hey, Amen. I'm right because I'm the dad. <laughs> they need to be emotional. Don't teach your children to be to emotionless. Don't tell them you can't get sad. Just tell them you can't get that sad. All right, you've cried long enough. 
You've been mad long enough. You get out of that room, come back downstairs, you're going to eat dinner with us. And you're not going to be that mad. I'm not coming down, I'm too mad. No, there's a limitation. I'm going to go ahead and help some of you. You can't let them get that sad. I heard an elder say to a friend of mine one time, I was standing there, he said, don't ever let yourself grieve that low again. She lost her spouse. He said, you, you allowed it to get too deep. He said, don't ever get that low again. I, I, I'd never heard it on that. And what he was saying was this. You, you have limitations to your grieving as well. There, you know, there's this verse that says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Every, everybody, everybody, life can be up and down. I mean, it can, it can get high. Well, when you get so excited, you go crazy. You, you don't need to get that excited. Like a Buckeye fan. Take your clothes off and have big letters painted on your shirt. And it's 25, that's just a little bit beyond the limits right there, I'm going to tell you. And, uh, um, but but everybody, everybody take your emotions and do like this. Normal people have emotions go up and down. Uh, they do. Life can, boy, you can get a, a raise and bang. Woo! Something great can happen. You get excited. It's okay. And, uh, but you can also get down. You lose the job. You lose a spouse. You lose a family. You, you, go, you lose a grandmother. I, I've seen them get so down that they, they, they come down here and just stay. Um, emotions aren't forever. They're moments and they're seasons. Let me, let me, let me help you right now. Um, you, you, you've got to understand that there's, there's, there's this gift called prayer. And David said, David made the statement in the Bible. He said, he said, I was so upset until I came into the sanctuary. The purpose of the church and the purpose of prayer and the purpose of his spirit is if you're too low, it'll bring you back to normal. And if you're too high, out of sorts, whether it's anger or some level of emotion, it'll put you right here. It is a stabilizer. God gives you the gift of prayer. Don't not one of you think, I'd be better off dead than alive. That's too low. Oh, I feel this for some reason. Oh, no, God's got a purpose for me. He's got a plan for me. I know it's tough today, but it's going to get better. And that's called a shield of faith. God's going to bring me through this. And, and, and watch this. Watch this. And it, and it says, and the child did minister, verse 12 says, now the sons of Eli were sons of what? Belial, they knew not the Lord. They are priests in the house of God receiving the sacrifices, but they didn't have a relationship with God. There's a difference between ministering in the house of God and ministering unto the Lord. There are people that could even be preachers that know not God. There it is. You could be a Sunday school teacher and know not the Lord. Just check off the list. And at the end of the day, what they were doing was not what they could give to the kingdom of God, what they could get from the kingdom of God. Church wasn't about the Lord, it was about them. You know, John F. Kennedy made that great statement. Don't ask what the... The, the, the nation can do for you. Ask what you can do for your nation. It's the way to serve the Lord. Sometimes we just go to God with a handout. God, can you heal me? Can you fix me? Can you do that? Oh, no. That's, there's a part of that. There's many times I say, God, I pleaded with the Lord. I needed him. But, oh, that's not all the time. It's God, what can I do? I want to be a blessing. You've been so good to me. Can you say amen? And so this contrast is Samuel, Samuel ministered to the Lord, but Eli's Sons that were priests, they knew not the Lord. As a matter of fact, they would take away from the altar instead of put on the altar. And I'm not going to divulge in that today. But it says, verse 17, are y'all there? Everybody say the contrast. Watch the contrast. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. They knew what they were doing. Uh, they knew the sin of those those young, those priests, Eli's sons in the house of the Lord, people didn't even want to go give a sacrifice. They didn't even want to go at this point because of the sins of these men. And uh, somebody say amen. Verse 18, their sin was wicked, but look at verse 18. Everybody say, but Samuel, minister before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. He's not even supposed to be wearing it. Because he's an Ephraimite. He's not even a Levite. The Levites were the priests. But God said, if I can't find anybody among the Levites, I'll raise me up somebody that's going to do it right. 
There will always be a generation that will do right when everything around them is not doing right. When those that should but won't, those that could but don't, God said, I'm gonna have somebody that's gonna stand up and live for me. How many know Noah, when the whole world was wicked, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and God spared the whole earth over one man. I want that to be my children. I want that to be your children. I want that, hey, in a world of chaos, I'm gonna have children that are gonna love God. Is there anybody that believes that? Everybody, everybody say there's a lot of wickedness in the world, but Samuel, he ministered. Read on, and it says in verse 20, 21 at the end, it says, and the child Samuel did what? Everybody say he grew. He's growing with chaos around him. He grew before the Lord. Look at verse 25. At the end, it says, notwithstanding, let's start there. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto the voice of their father. The prophet said, I heard about the sins. God has seen the sins of your sons. Go fix it. Go fix the sins of your son. He went down and he told him, he said, I've heard what you've been doing. You've been committing sin and whored him at the door of the tabernacle. And he said, I want it to stop. You quit it, but he didn't stop it. He let it go on. And it says, notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father because the Lord would, what? Slay them. God was going to remove them because they would not change. Look at the next verse. Look what it says. And the child Samuel, they wouldn't heed to correction, but Samuel kept on growing. My, this is powerful. And was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. God gave him favor with God and the people around him. There was something about him that was becoming. There was something about him that was attractive. I'm not talking about his looks. Here he is. He has uncut hair. He doesn't eat of the vine, and he doesn't go to funeral. He doesn't touch dead things. What I'm saying to you is our children should be different from the world. They should be different. I'm just going to tell you, just because it says everybody on the video game doesn't mean everybody needs to be playing the video game. Just because the ratings it seems to be family oriented doesn't mean it's gonna be family oriented. Parents gotta guard what comes in that house. You gotta, I don't care if their bedroom says no trespassing my private room and it has a skull picture on the room. It doesn't matter. Don't come in. That's not their room. You pay the light bill, you clean the room and make sure there's nothing unholy there. I, I, I. I just want to tell you, if you want your children to thrive, you can't let them digest what everybody else is digesting. They don't need a computer in a bedroom. They don't need a device laying beside their bed at night. And you say, well, my kid's more mature. Probably one of the most ignorant statements I've ever heard any parent made, and I've had dozens and dozens and dozens in 18 years being, that have told me, well, my child's mature for their age. No, they're not. They might be taller than the other kid, have more responsibility than somebody their age, but it doesn't mean they're more mature. They're still a child. They can't think beyond 15 minutes, according to study. They, don't, they can't think beyond what they're going to do in 15 minutes, and they can't remember the repercussions of what happened 15 minutes ago. They have to have an adult. Their brain, their brain doesn't even mature until they're 25. Doesn't that explain a lot? I'm talking about training up your children, understanding they're a child. They need responsibility. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you this. They will live up, up to the expectations that you put on them. If you treat them as if they're young, treat them as if they've never been anything better than that, they won't. But challenge your children to be responsible, to be disciplined, and to be children of God. Let's stand to our feet and clap our hands and thank God for his word. Amen. Say, say this with me. Say, there's a difference between surviving and thriving. I want, I want you to say this. My children are going to be better than I am. You need to want your children to be more successful than you. That's the goal. They're going to be better than me. They're going to act better than me. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a study at Purdue University. I'm going to give you a thought and let you go drink coffee and get your kids and bring them back. We're going to worship together. And uh, uh, you're going to have a break. At Purdue University, they developed a seed. They developed a process called, they hybridize seed. And uh, they can take corn, hybridize the corn, 
and let it grow in Canada where the growing season is very short amount of time. And that seed will produce corn crops in Canada. They have the ability to take that seed and plant it where it will thrive. In Arizona, where it's a dry climate, they have the ability to take corn and hybridize it where it will flourish in a dry climate. It's specialized for a certain climate. Guess what? When the Bible says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, what that means, you and your children have been hybridized by God for this generation. And Samuel was hybridized when there was hypocrisy all around him. No matter what those evil sons did, Samuel grew on. They shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Can you say amen? Amen. They shall produce its fruit in the season, Psalms 1. And whatsoever they do shall prosper. I want you to say we're going to thrive and not just survive. Somebody say they grew on. Look at your neighbor and say we're going to grow on. Don't leave. Don't check out. Uh, This is just the first part of our service.